Last week, Pastor Mark talked about this virtual pastor from the world of the internet. Today, you're stuck with him. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're watching online, then I'm still virtual Tim. Um, if you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 5. We're going to get to there a little later. Wax on, wax off. What movie is that from? Karate Kid. Kid. How many of you have seen the original Karate Kid? I'm not talking Karate Kid 2, the next Karate Kid, or the reboot with Jaden Smith. I'm talking the original classic cinematography masterpiece from 1984, okay? For those of you that haven't seen it, it's about Daniel LaRusso. He's this little kid, he moves, not teenager, he moves to California, and uh, he bumps into Mr. Miyagi, and uh, he wants Mr. Miyagi to teach him karate, so Mr. Miyagi agrees, and the next day, or, uh, Danielson, as he calls him now, shows up, and he's ready to learn karate, he's ready to work, and Miyagi puts him to work by doing chores around the house. Sand the floor, paint the fence, and of course, wax the car, wax on, wax off. And Danielson's like, okay, this is kind of weird, but I'll do this, and hopefully when I'm done these chores, we'll get to learn karate. So he's doing them, and then the next day he comes, more wax on, more wax off, and he's getting a little frustrated, and he's going, when are we gonna learn karate? When, why do we just keep doing this? And, and all of a sudden, there comes this moment where Miyagi takes him and he shows him those chores that he was doing were actually skills in karate. Wax on, wax off, were actual karate moves that are now etched in his brain. And so we see that Danielson, even though he didn't understand, he obeyed in the moment, and then he learned to trust and obey his master. And I thought that was a great picture of our relationship with God as we look at this thing called obedience that we're going to look at today. And so um, in my house, obedience is kind of a buzzword lately. I have a toddler and a soon-to-be toddler and uh, if you're a parent, you'll know this picture right here. It says, silence is golden unless you have a toddler. In that case, silence is very suspicious. <laughs> so we're on this journey of teaching our kids obedience. And it's fascinating to watch kids test and push the limits of obedience. Um, they're hearing what I'm saying. And you could tell our, our toddler is processing it. And she's thinking of how far she can get to the line without crossing it to get disciplined. And she's learning this whole thing called obedience. And uh, as parents, we're trying to help our kids to learn that God created us, God loves us, and we actually owe God our obedience. Not us, but we owe God our obedience. See, obedience is a little countercultural. Our world emphasizes independence, being assertive, but obedience is all about submission and serving. I want to share with you a story uh, from Craig Rochelle. He's a pastor. He was sharing this story on a message on bold obedience. And he said he was 19, 20 years old. He was a new Christian at the time. He was attending this church service. And he saw this woman across the room who clearly had a rough life. And he felt like God put a burden on his heart to give her all the money he had in his wallet. And he's like thinking about this. And he's questioning, is that God? Was that Satan? No, Satan wouldn't tempt me to be generous. Uh, okay, whatever, he kind of, if I have to do this, I wonder how much money I have in my wallet. So he pulls out his wallet, he looks inside, and all he's got is a $5 bill. He's like, well, that's stupid. It's a measly five bucks. What good is that going to do? I'm not going to give someone a, hey, excuse me, here's a $5 bill. Like, he thought that was ridiculous. So he put it back in his wallet, and he put it back in his pocket, and he couldn't shake this feeling. And God kept saying, give her all the money you have in your wallet. So he goes, he's like, okay, I'm a new Christian, I better obey God. So he goes up to this woman, and he says, excuse me, I know, I know this is weird, but God said I need to give you this $5. I know it's not much, but here you go. The woman takes the $5. She looks at it, looks at Craig, looks at the $5. Throws her hands up in the air and says, thank you, God! And Craig's like going, okay, what happened here? Did God miraculously change that $5 into $5,000? What's going on here? And she goes, you have to hear this. I'm a single mom. I have no money, I don't get paid until next week, and I really wanted to get to church. There's no gas in my car, there's just enough gas for me to get to church, but I wanted to go. And she said, I prayed, and I felt like God said, just trust me, go to church, and I will get you home. And God has answered my prayer. And Craig's like going, oh, this is great. 
But remember, he was a new Christian, so self took over, and he's thinking, well, that's great for you, but that was kind of my lunch money. He didn't say that to her, but that's what he was thinking. <laughs> and at the end of the service, one of his buddies comes up, and he's like, hey, Craig, we going out for lunch? He's like, no, sorry, I can't. And the guy goes, I'm buying. He's like, okay, where are we going? Let's go. <laughs> and he said that day he got an $8 lunch out of a $5 gift. And isn't that often how God works when we, yeah, you can give God a hand for that. When we obey and step out in obedience, God will use that to bless someone, and then he will bless us with the overflow. Fast forward a couple years, Craig's still telling this story, and uh, a couple years later, he's in the service, and he gets that same feeling again. He's like, oh boy, I know what this feels like. You know, he's thinking, five bucks in my wallet, no big deal, I'll do this again. So he pulls out his wallet, he opens it up, there's a $100 bill. I don't have the $100 bill to show you. I know you guys are waiting, but there's a $100 bill in his wallet. And he goes, oh man, a $100 bill? And he's like, Satan, is that you tempting me to be like Jesus again? And, and he felt like God said he had to do this. He had to give this guy a $100 bill, but this time he didn't do it. You could say that he had $5 obedience, but he didn't have $100 obedience. And he said to this day, he wonders, what did God want to do in that guy's life and what blessing did I miss out on from not obeying? Obedience is doing the next right thing in our faith journey. God wants us to respond to the promptings in our heart and the teachings in his word and when we boldly obey, we'll experience him in a new way. So how do we obey? A lot of times, the Christian life, people think, is just about following a bunch of rules and doing this and doing that because we're supposed to or because we're told to. And that's not really what we're talking about. Rick Warren came up with this thing called the obedience equation. I'm kind of a math guy. I like equations. And so I'm going to show you the obedience equation. This is how you obey. Love plus trust plus action equals obedience. And the order is important too. So let's quickly look at these three things. The first one is love. We obey not out of an obligation, but because out of a love, a relationship with God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, obey what I command. The first step is not just to blindly follow a bunch of rules, but to love God, love Jesus, love the Holy Spirit. It starts with love. When we love God and believe, believe that he loves us and believe that he has the best in store for us, then that becomes the reason we obey. It's not about obeying God and doing all these things so that he will love us. It's about understanding that because God loves us and because he knows what's best for us, that's why we obey. God wants what's good for us. And that leads to the second part of the obedience equation. Love plus trust. Out of that love comes a trust. Danielson trusted Miyagi, even though he didn't understand it at the time. When it comes to trusting Jesus, can we say the same thing? Watch this video. Jesus, I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you, I just don't. <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help you. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, do you trust me? Uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. All right, well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, all right, okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? Uh, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust Good. you. <laughs> yes, I do trust you. I'm going to fall okay. back. Ooh. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's great. Uh, okay. Let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted. All right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay, I'm gonna do it. All right. I'm really gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Ah! Oh, Jesus, you really caught yeah. me! I didn't think you were gonna catch me, but you did! Oh, that was great! <laughs> that was great! <laughs> You're ready for level two! Level two, here yes. I come, baby! Woo! Whoa. <laughs> Okay, hold it. <laughs> oh, you know what? You're too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this one's a little bit different, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh huh. But face me. Woo! Forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right. The Jesus signal. <laughs> yes, the okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you so much. Good. 
fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> Especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. It's easy to trust when we're sure of the outcome, but sometimes we don't want to trust and obey when we don't see the outcome or when we think the outcome will turn out badly. God often asks us to trust, even when it might not make sense to us. I want to show you a verse in Luke 5, uh, or a couple of verses. And Jesus is with the disciples, who are fishermen, and they're in a boat. And they had just finished speaking to the crowds. And let's look at verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper, and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, say, but if you say so. I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon the boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. It comes down to answering the question, who are you going to trust? Do we trust that Jesus really knows what's best for us? Or do we prefer to do things our own way? It's like the story of Jack. He was walking along this steep cliff and he accidentally fell off the cliff and he's falling and, and he grabs onto this branch and he's holding onto this branch and he looks down and there's like a thousand foot drop beneath him and he's got no way of coming up. So he starts yelling for help and he goes, help, help, is there anybody up there? Help me. And he hears nothing. And so he's yelling, help, help me. And he waits for a long time and he's about to give up. And then he hears a voice, Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm right here. I can see you, Jack. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Who are you? Where are you? I'm God, Jack. I'm everywhere. God, yes, please help me. Please help me. If you help me, I promise I'll stop sinning. I, I'll be a good person. I'll, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. <laughs> Easy on the promises, Jack. Let's just get you off of the cliff first. All right, I need you to listen carefully. Yes, God, anything you do, anything you say, I'll do it, I'll do it. Anything you say. All right, that branch you're holding... Let it go. No, sorry. <laughs> let go of the branch, Jack. What, God? You want me to let go of the branch? Yes. Trust me, Jack. Just trust me. Let go of the branch. And then there's silence. Jack is thinking about this. And then all of a sudden he yells, Help, help! Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> the obedience equation. It starts with love. We need to love God. And then when we love God, we need to trust God. And trusting God should lead us to action. God wants us to do something. Everyone say, do something. The quote in the video intro, in case you missed it, was, I was standing there waiting for someone to do something until I realized the person I was waiting for was myself. We need to do something. It's not about what you know, it's about what you do. The difference is in the doing. Someone said that instant obedience will teach you more about God than a lifetime of Bible discussions. Applying a little bit is better than knowing a lot. Doing something is what makes a difference in this world. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about big thinking in small places. What are the small places where you need to obey and actually take action and do something? When I got married, we moved into a side-by-side -side townhouse and uh, we had neighbors on each side and I wanted to do something to show my neighbors the love of Jesus. And my plan was to wait for the snow to fall and I was going to shovel their walks. I was going to like show them my servant heart and they would wonder why I'm such a willing soul and I would share with them the love of Jesus. And so waiting for the first snowfall, it snows heavy, it's Saturday morning, I wake up. Now remember, this is before I had kids, so Saturday morning started a lot later when there's not a crying baby and an energetic toddler in the house. So I wake up, I put on my snow gear, I get my snow, I went out and bought a snow shovel for this, I didn't have one before. I get my snow shovel, I walk to the window, and I see my neighbor just finishing up shoveling my walk. <laughs> and I was so mad at him. Not to his face, I was all thankful, but I was so mad because I'm thinking, that jerk. <laughs> 
he shoveled my walk. Now, next time, even if I get there before him, all I'm doing is repaying the favor. There's no like showing him God's love by my servant. I'm just repaying the favor. And I was like mad. So fast forward a couple years, we moved to a, a house. I got a fresh start, new neighbors doing the same thing. I'm going to show my neighbors the love of Jesus. The snow comes, the snow everywhere. I grab my shovel, I run outside. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm the first person out there, ready to go. Go to my neighbors, I start shoveling her walk, shoveling her walk, and I see her walk by the window, and I'm like, oh yeah, shoveling. <laughs> she comes out the door, and I'm like, oh, we're going to have a good conversation now. I'm going to give Jesus to her, and I'm shoveling. And then she goes, stop shoveling. And I was like, Okay, I'm like, hey, still shoveling. And she's like, stop shoveling. I hire professionals to do that. And I'm like, I can't win. <laughs> the book of Acts is all about boldness and obedience. And we're going to look at a story in Acts 5. And we're going to look at three thoughts of bold obedience. In Acts 5, we're starting to see the early church. And the apostles are boldly declaring Jesus. And they're seeing many signs and wonders. And then we see some of the religious leaders who are unhappy with this. Let's look at Acts 5, verse 17. The high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. First thought on bold obedience is that bold obedience brings opposition. Bold obedience, a lot of times, isn't easy, and it brings opposition. The, the, the apostles here were boldly obeying the call of God, and they faced opposition. They got thrown in jail. If you're not ready to face opposition for your obedience, you might not be ready to be used by God. An example of this in our youth ministry. For a long time, our youth ministry was one big group of grades 7 to 12 students. And I felt like God was calling us to split the youth ministry up into a separate junior high and high school ministries. And um, at the time, or right now, this seems normal, but at the time, this was very different. I could see that the needs of a grade 6, 7 junior higher are much different than the needs of a grade 11 and 12 student. And this is what I felt like we needed to do. And it definitely wasn't an easy choice. I knew some people wouldn't be happy. People don't like change. And it was actually double the work. It was two ministries, two nights a week, two volunteer teams. But I felt like this is where God was leading us. And so I took a step of obedience, and I did face opposition for a year. Parents told me all these reasons why this new way of doing things was terrible, and they didn't like it, and how we should go back to the old way, and how they wanted exceptions. But we kind of stuck to our guns and said, this is what we feel like God is doing. And now, it's totally normal and no one wants to go back to the other way where we have this big, wide range of kids in one room and everyone is so thankful that we can target junior hires and we can target high school kids and meet their needs where they're at. But at the time, I could see that obedience can bring opposition. Obedience is not always the easy thing to do. See, many people view the will of God as this flowery yellow brick road that leads from one awesome thing to another until eventually we just land on heaven's doorstep. And it wasn't that way for the disciples. It wasn't that way for Paul. And it wasn't that way for Jesus. God's call in our lives can lead us into some dark places. It can lead us into some heavy times. It can lead us into some dark circumstances and some difficult circumstances. Most of the time, God's call of obedience leads us away from the comfortable. I like being comfortable. Believe it or not, I'm kind of an introvert. I know it's hard to believe with the costumes at Easter with Doc Brown and Batman and Ham Solo and all that stuff, but I am actually kind of an introvert and I'm always having to learn how to move out of my comfort zone because it's in our comfort zone that we feel strong, we feel smart. And then we can move forward as long as we don't leave our zone. And it's when we get stretched and pushed past our comfort zone that we want to hit the brakes, slam it into reverse and scoot right back into our comfort zone so we risk not feeling weak or stupid. But it's outside of our comfort zone that we learn to lean on God for our strength and not on our own comfort. There's a quote from a book called Do Hard Things, which is a book about teenagers actually breaking through low expectations and accomplishing great things for God. And the quote is, we aren't called to be successful all the time. We're called to be faithful, to take those first difficult steps and leave the results up to God. Sometimes we might obey and not succeed, and that's totally okay. But the problem is when we start making excuses to not obey in the first place. We know we should obey God, but a lot of times you could say, a big butt gets in the way. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practiced. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. But I'm tired. But the game is on. But I got to check Facebook. But it's boring. But I don't have enough money yet. But others won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask. But I just can't get motivated. But I'm afraid. Whatever God asks us to do, 
We seem to have a but for it to get away. And when we can get past the excuses, we can truly make a difference with our obedience. Obedience is hard. Bold obedience brings opposition. We see the disciples in Acts boldly declaring the name of Jesus and then getting thrown in jail for it. But that leads to our next thought. Bold obedience brings the blessings and even miracles of God. Let's look at the next verse, Acts 5, verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. I just love how casual that is. It's just a statement, no emotion, no explanation of the angel or how it happened. I'd totally be freaking out at this. They got thrown in jail and this huge angel came and like did karate on the guards, wax on, wax off. See what I did there? And, and they came and grabbed this big sword and smashed the lock and they got out of the jail. But Luke is all matter of fact. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Ho-hum. And I think one of the reasons for that is that when you're boldly obeying God, you're actually not surprised by the blessings and even miracles of God. You obey and you expect God to move. It's not that anything ever goes wrong or, you know, that you have a bad day. These guys were in prison. That was bad. But in the middle of the bad day, God shows his power. Obedience brings blessing. There's this news story about the destruction of a, of a hurricane in southern Florida. And in the midst of the destruction and the debris, there was one house that stood among all these other houses that got knocked down. And the owner of that house was clearing up his yard. And the reporter came by and was asking this gentleman about his house and why his house was the only one that was standing. And he said, I built this house myself. And I built it according to Florida State Building Code. And when the code asked for two by six trusses, I used two by six trusses. I was told that a house built by the code would be able to withstand a hurricane. And it looks like no one else around here obeyed the code. See, obedience brings blessing. Obedience doesn't guarantee a special treatment or smooth sailing, but there are benefits to obeying God. I'll tell you a story about before I came on staff here at the church. Last week, Pastor Mark was joking that I did online church from my 7x7 seven seven cubicle. You remember that? Virtual pastor thing. Uh, you guys want to see my office before I came on staff at church? All right, show the picture. Here was my office before I came on staff at church. No joke, at the time I was doing a computer tech support job and I was also volunteering at the youth ministry here at the church, but I took a year off to go work on that exact cruise ship. And I was the recreation coordinator, go figure, I was in charge of fun. Uh, if you've ever been on a cruise, I was like the assistant cruise director, making sure everyone's having a good time, hosting games, that kind of thing. And I spent time in the Caribbean and Alaska. And it was about a year that I was on the ship. And at the end of my contract, I felt like God was calling me to come back home and not to go do another contract. Well, they offered me to, to, to send me home for a month, and then they offered me my next contract, which, remember, I was, felt like God was saying I was supposed to say no. They offered me to fly me to Lisbon, Portugal, where I would do the same job cruising Europe for seven, eight months, and then take the ship to the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, and then back to the Caribbean. And I'd be on there for a year, doing fun on the cruise ship in Europe. Doesn't that sound awesome? <laughs> remember, I felt like God says, you're supposed to go home. So I took two days to argue with God. Anyone ever done that before? <laughs> Tried to convince God that my plan sounds way cooler than his plan? So I argued with God for two days. I email everyone back home, and, and the responses I get were, you, you should totally do this. This is the job of a lifetime. It's a dream job. It's just a year. You can come back then. Except two people, Pastor Duane and my buddy Jay, who's actually here this morning. And they both said, you know what you're supposed to do. I was like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this quote from Charles Colson. He says, never confuse the will of the majority with the will of God. So I begrudgingly said no, came home to my old job. And then within a year, I actually started taking Bible school classes online. And then shortly after that, I did an internship here at the church and I've been on staff ever since. And I've been on, I was 10 years ago that I started on staff. And to this day, I don't regret taking that step of obedience. I feel, yeah, you can give God a hand for that. I feel incredibly blessed to where God has brought me today and I don't regret that decision and who knows what would have happened if I had disobeyed that call and I'd probably still be cruising Europe somewhere. Wait, that actually does sound kind of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can all think of a blessing in your life that came from your obedience. Hebrews 10, 36 says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Bold obedience brings the blessings and even miracles of God. Third thought on obedience is that bold obedience always requires faith. So the disciples obeyed. 
Then they get thrown in jail, opposition. Then an angel comes out and gets them out of jail. Blessing. Now let's look at the next verse to see what happens. Then he told them, this is the angel speaking, go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Basically, the angel is saying, go back and do the thing that got you thrown in jail. Go back and do the thing you're not supposed to do that the people don't like. That is going to take faith to obey. Every single time God prompts you to do something, it's going to take faith to obey. A lot of times when we talk about having the faith to obey, we want the details. We want to know the whole plan. And sometimes God is saying, you want the details? You can't handle the details. Sometimes if we would know the details, we probably would run and not obey. It makes me think of the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. God told Joshua that he's got to get the Israelites to overtake the city of Jericho to walk around the wall in silence for six days. And then on the seventh day, after they walk, they're supposed to give a big shout and the walls are coming, tumbling down and they're going to go overtake the city. Well, I don't think that Joshua filled in the Israelites on the whole plan. He just told them bit by bit and they were walking around the wall. Day one. Day two, they're walking around the wall in silence. They're obeying. By day two, if I'm there, I'm thinking this Joshua guy is a little nutty because I want to see like something happen to the wall, right? We're walking around it a whole day in silence and then another whole day in silence. I'm thinking like Jenga or something. Take a block from the bottom and you put it on top. You know, like something <laughs> happening to the wall. God wanted them to step out in obedience and they believed that God's ways were better than probably what they were thinking and they were able, able to achieve success because they obeyed. Even when it seems weird, even when it doesn't make sense, God wants to ultimately show you that he is in control and he is working. Will you still obey when the answer hasn't come for six days? Will you still pray when you don't see that answer? Will you still serve when it seems nobody is appreciating you? Sometimes obedience doesn't make sense, but we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't need to understand to obey. Obedience is our responsibility, but the outcome is God's responsibility. Recently in an online service, there was someone named Brad and he shared this story in the chat about someone who stepped out boldly in his life and it led to him coming back to God. I'm going to read you what he said. This is in the chat. He said, sometimes God speaks to us to do or say something to someone and we question, is it really God? I left home because of how I was living and I tried to get away from God. I ended up in Calgary. Apparently that's where you go when you're running away from God, Calgary. <laughs> Out on the street in the middle of the night, a total stranger came up to me and said, you're not supposed to be here. You can't run away from God. And he was like blown away. And he says, this, he spoke to me because God had told him to. I have no idea who he was and he doesn't know what that meant to my life. I was only 17 and within two months I was back home and had resubmitted my life to Jesus. I'm 52 now and still living for him. When we don't know the details, we need to obey in the moment and trust that God is going to work it out. Even when we don't know the future, we need to obey in the present. We need to go with whatever details we know in the moment and trust that God is going to weave it into his plan. Even if it seems small, even if it seems insignificant, we need to obey. Great faith starts with something small. Obedience is doing the next right thing in our faith journey. Let's go back to Acts, the next verse, 521. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. The angel tells them to go do the thing that got them thrown in jail in the first place. And in the very next verse, they're back at it. They didn't delay. They obeyed fully. See, partial obedience or even delayed obedience can actually be disobedience. In verse 528, they get in trouble again. And then in verse 29, they're telling the high council, we must obey God rather than man. The apostles here are saying, when you have seen what we have seen, when you have heard what we've heard, we can't not talk about Jesus. We have to obey Craig Rochelle says, bold obedience is behavior born out of belief. In closing, I want to tell you a story of Nick. You might have seen Nick speak on TV or on YouTube, and I want to show you a little video to introduce you to Nick. I was born in Melbourne, Australia, 1982, and my parents had no idea that I was going to be born without arms or legs. I was the only one that I ever saw without limbs. My faith in Jesus Christ was sealed after seven years of wondering why, God, I was born this way. Uh, he answered me very clearly through John chapter 9. 
and I gave my life to Jesus at 15 after reading about how he came across a man who was born blind. And I'm like, hey, hold on a second. This looks interesting. <laughs> and no one knew why he was born that way. I'm like, perfect. So I read on and in verse three of the ninth chapter, Jesus said, it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. And I'm like, wow, God, if you had a plan for the blind man, you do have a plan for me. And that was the beginning of my personal relationship with Jesus. Youth groups were starting to call me. Churches were starting to call me. Opportunities were opening up everywhere for me to share my testimony. I was speaking in front of 300 sophomore public high school students. Three minutes into it, half the girls were crying. One girl in the middle of the room started weeping. She put up her hand and she said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but can I come up there and give you a hug? In front of everyone, she came and she hugged me. She cried on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, no one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. I couldn't believe it, it changed my life. That was when I knew I was called to be a worldwide evangelist. Nick has said that you don't know what you can achieve. Yeah. Nick has said you don't know what you can achieve until you try, but you don't know what God can do until you can trust. Remember, obedience is love plus trust plus action. Nick discovered the love of Jesus and he put his trust in God and then he took action and he had the opportunity to travel the world speaking to thousands of people about the love of Jesus and millions more on the internet. He said he has prayed for arms and legs, but he felt God say, do you want 90 years with arms and legs or do you want what I want? He discovered that God had a better plan, even when it didn't make sense at times. That doesn't mean that Nick says this. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a pair of shoes in his closet in case God ever does say yes. He says he does. Don't know what size. And in the meantime, he's obeying God's call in his life. God has a plan for you, no matter what your age. I tell our junior hires all the time, you are not too young to make a difference in this world. You are not too young to obey the call of God. And there might be some in this room that might need to hear that you're not too old to make a difference in this world. It drives me crazy when I hear people saying they're too old to be a youth leader. Our young people don't just need more young people in their lives. They need an older generation to affirm them, to encourage them, and to give wisdom in their lives. God has a plan for you no matter what your past is. Don't assume that God's will is for someone else or that his plans are for later. If you're in this room or if you're watching online, he has something for you to do right now that you need to obey. We're always on a journey, figuring out what God's will is and what that next step is. Ask God, what is my next step? What is the next thing you want me to do? Maybe you need to forgive someone. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's a tough financial decision. Maybe it's a habit or an addiction that you need to break or something that you need to confess to someone. What is that next step that you need to obey? Remember, obedience is love plus trust plus action. If we can grab a hold of these three things, we're on our way to hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's stand together. If I can get everyone just to close their eyes and bow their heads. For some in this room, that next step might be taking that step of accepting Jesus as your Savior for the first time. We've been talking a lot about doing, but it's important to know that it's not our actions that get us into heaven. God's word is clear that you can't earn your salvation. It comes by his grace, not by our effort. The Bible says that Jesus was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Taking the ultimate punishment for our sins because of his great love for us. And he rose from the grave so that we can have a relationship with him and spend eternity with him in heaven. And if you want to make that decision to follow Jesus today, no one's looking around, everyone's eyes are closed. If you want to start that journey with Jesus today, just raise your hand so I can see it and you can put it down again. Is there anyone here that wants to start that journey with Jesus today? 
okay? Or maybe you have way in the past and you want to come back to God today. Yeah, you can put your hands down. Is there anyone that wants to come back to God today? Okay. We're going to pray a prayer. And if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this. And I said I wouldn't single anybody out, so we're all going to pray this together. Repeat after me. Jesus, I thank you that you love me. And I confess that I'm a sinner. Living a life separate from you. But today I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And you rose again to be my Lord and Savior. Today I choose to follow you. Change me from the inside out. Help me to obey. To love. To trust. And to take action. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give God a hand today.